Every now and then, I revisit the Tekken games and play a lot of them in a marathon, and I have a grand time with them, thanks in no small part to the series' excellent cast of characters. From the storied Mishima clan to smaller-scale passionate pugilists like King and Steve Fox. Though the characters of Tekken that I find myself most consistently drawn to and remember most fondly are the game's women fighters, significantly more so than most other fighting games. I'd go as far as to say Tekken has the highest volume of best girls in the fighting game community, able to stand tall among the phenomenal likes of Chun-Li and Cassie Cage, in a rarely seen mob of memorable faces all in one game. It's entirely possible that Bandai Namco is just that good at girl fighters, full stop, but I felt there was something to explore with how the leading ladies of Tekken never fail to stay with me. Let's start at the very beginning, when the first Tekken game came out in 1994, where its most comparable and relevant competition was Street Fighter 2 and the first two Virtua Fighter games. Mortal Kombat and Killer Instinct were also making big names for themselves at the time, but their respective tones and characters are so overtly fantasy flavored that I want to set them aside as outliers for the moment. Street Fighter, Virtua Fighter, and Tekken all focused on more down-to-earth martial artists fighting in rings of sport, and as such they pull from very similar archetypes. I don't think I am breaking immense ground when I point out the similarities between Street Fighter's Ryu and Virtua Fighter's Akira. For sake of my point, I'm gonna pull together the options for women fighters in Street and Virtua Fighter. Chun-Li, Kami, Pai Chan, and Sarah Bryant. What we have here are four women, two of Chinese origin and two blondes from the UK and US, who use fast, lightweight fighting styles with emphasis on acrobatics. In terms of background, they're all upstanding personalities with occupations in law enforcement, military service, entertainment, and education. I like all four of these fighters, but a light shines on some of their derivative qualities when you compare them to the first playable women of Tekken, Nina Williams and Michelle Chan. Nina hails from Ireland and may look like her toe-headed peers, but makes her living as an assassin. Existing in a moral gray area and displaying out of most of her peers in Tekken the fewest qualms with killing, extremely contrary to the more squeaky clean likes of the characters I mentioned before who only partook in adversarious roles in story threads involving brainwashing. Michelle Chang, a woman of half Chinese and half Native American background, fights with a blend of fighting styles including Ken and wrestling, making her a rare case of a woman who, rather than fighting with energy blasts or physics-defying flips, was perfectly capable of heavy contact submission holds and pile drivers, the likes of which were archetypically often reserved for burly male fighters. Nina and Michelle were the first fighters to break the molds of the archetypes set around them. Freely deadly, if not a tad sinister, as well as driven and stepping into fighting niches often reserved for the opposite sex. I feel these two really paved the way for the sneaky and sultry ladies of Dead or Alive, as well as the more forward and physically imposing likes of Soul Calibur's Ivy. Tekken's female ensemble only grew from there, and helping each one stay distinct in such a sea of strong fighters is, of all things, Tekken's impeccable breadth of clothing options. Tekken always offered two or three personal outfits for each character, and especially for girls, each outfit is a totally different glimpse of that character's life and various aspects of their narrative. Take Asuka Kazama, whose three costumes reflect her more traditional martial arts inclination, her school life, and her more sporty, rambunctious tendencies, with no real overlap in aesthetic quality, and yet nothing feeling out of place in establishing her personality and background. I love how even the older Tekken games, despite their less defined textures and aesthetics due to the era it was made in, still created really distinct outfits for each character. Kazuya and Nina had just as much drip on the PS1 as they do today. I love the different looks you can bestow on Jun Kazama. On one hand, you can have her harness her natural tendencies in hiking shorts and a top with pockets that is easy to imagine her for various survival supplies and tools, as well as practical sneakers for the outdoors. Her Player 2 outfit switches her over to a button-down blouse, loafers, more contained headband for her hair, and dress pants, painting an image of a woman who has very different aspects of her life, as an authority of natural justice doesn't just live in the woods. Both of Michelle's outfits reflect her indigenous background and off-the-grid lifestyle, with animal skins and appropriate paraphernalia. But despite both being indicative of similar qualities of the character, they use entirely different color schemes and seem to be for different occasions. 
a heavier ensemble with a coat and jeans as opposed to a sportier set of shorts, athletic wear, and stockings. Even if the lower grade graphics of the time sometimes made these aesthetics hard to decipher, the cast of Tekken is among the best dressed on the original PlayStation. And while the likes of Tifa Lockhart and Lara Croft have inarguably earned the title of the leading ladies of this era of gaming, I can't help but notice how similar June and Michelle dress to them. And the fact that they both predate those respective characters by a couple years makes me wonder if there's impact the girls of Tekken had that perhaps goes unsung. Though no small contributor to those characters in particular falling to the wayside is how quickly Tekken can sometimes grow disinterested with characters and put them on a bus. Between Tekken 2 and 3 is a 15 year time gap, during which June and Michelle age past their prime as fighters and are supplanted by their respective children from that point of the series onward. Mind you, I'm here to praise the women fighters of Tekken, not necessarily Namco's treatment of them. I think it says a lot about the fighting game landscape that a woman is seen as too old to fight past the age of 30 or so in this context, to the point that Nina Williams survived this purge only because she was cryogenically frozen over this time skip. As someone who would call June and Michelle my favorite fighters in early Tekken and among my top 5 in the whole franchise, this stings a little, and yet the strength of these characters is so that I still find a silver lining to the choices to sideline these characters, largely because they show such an immense narrative growth by retiring from fighting. It sucks that Michelle would be absent from Tekken's ongoing games because she decided to settle down and be a mother so her progeny could take her place, but it's pretty rare that a fighting game character can even progress in such a way at all. A lot of similar staples of the genre are very much expected to stay young and super hot to keep kicking above the height of their head in a place of glory. That's not to say retiring a woman so she can have a family is necessarily progressive, but I imagine such a move on part of Michelle would pave the way for characters to have the best of of both worlds like Sonya Blade, who would in Mortal Kombat X have a daughter and continue to fight well into her 50s. Street Fighter would also introduce Crimson Viper, who's also a mother when not on the battlefield. And characters that continue to fight after motherhood may make Michelle look a little bad by comparison, but I believe at least in part Michelle was responsible for sculpting the path of these story arcs in the first place, and for that she's owed something. In fact, despite all that, Tekken even kind won this particular race too because Nina, during her aforementioned cryo sleep, was artificially inseminated, birthing the character Steve Fox during her coma. And while there's space to argue this is kind of an exploitive, if not bizarre, storyline, I always really like this thread. Nina awakes from her experimental sleep with no memory of her past life or her fertilization that was ostensibly against her will. And while carrying out her career as a contract killer, she's hired to assassinate someone when she realizes it's her son who has grown up while she was asleep for years. This storyline is beyond strange, but feels weirdly groundbreaking as the first finagling to make a woman fight her own son in a fighting game. It makes Nina, once a heartless killer, her most vulnerable place in the whole story, and the parallels to real life potential trauma just speaks to me as something extremely daring Tekken took with its most iconic female fighter. Tekken's hard veering turns with all of these characters sometimes resulted in choices that were disappointing or confusing. They were massive risks I hardly see other fighting game series taking until recently with their girl characters. The circumstances that put Nina in this position are definitely bewildering, but the fact that the woman who spent years of video game spotlight trying to murder her own sister is seen here setting aside her duty as a killer to save her son's life is honestly pretty breathtaking. It's harder to make lemons out of lemonade of June's circumstances, considering she gets pretty harshly fridged off screen at the hand of Tekken 3's villain, Ogre, igniting her son to fight her place, but I intend to still etch out a bright side, even if it would require stretching out of canon a bit. See, Tekken was always about the conflict between Kazuya and Heihachi, the father and son constantly throwing each other off increasingly perilous means of heights. June was pretty much the constant good in that mix, and it was her union with Kazuya that bore Jin, who was to be the new big good of Tekken, until he turns out to take after his father, feeding the flames of hatred and conflict 
between the family, with no one in way of June around to set him on the right path now. June's death would remain permanent, and though rarely alluded to, it's hard not to imagine how appalled June would be by her family's fighting and how swiftly, perhaps, she could put a stop to it. And I think this is more or less the reason we've never seen her in direct canon again. We only get a glimpse of her posthumous psyche in the Tekken Tag Tournament spin-offs. Being dream match games where every character, no matter their status, is brought back for a non-canonical party brawl, June makes her long-awaited comebacks in the tag games, but is counterintuitively postured as the game's final boss. You fight June in a serene, peaceful landscape that invokes heaven, and the first round of your battle with her occurs in ankle-deep water to tranquil music. Then after you knock her down once, an inky substance leaks into the oasis where you fought, and everything fades to a terrifying black. June becomes a malevolent being only called Unknown. And if fighting her as we know her is what occurs in round one, round two is us fighting her stained memory. Her physical embodiment of dead dreams of peace as her entire family has carried on fighting after her death. Unknown has very little direct explanation, and she seems to be an emblem of the duality-related themes of Tech and Tag as a being of pure good and pure evil back to back, but just as much so as the ideal she carried in her short life and the horrid reality that waited after her passing. June wanted nothing but to beget peace and love, but her memory is practically stained by the destruction bred by her family after her passing. And it's these opposite extremes we quite literally fight in the form of June herself and unknown. And I feel with any fighting game characters, let alone women, it's hard to find a big populace as you could say any of that about it, at least for a long time. Fighting games need to sell you a character on the spot, and what doesn't lend itself well to that notion is a character growing too old to properly fight, retiring to raise a family, becoming a metaphor for hellbound dreams after death. This sounds like a nightmarish checklist for waifu hunters all over. But Tekken's women fighters set some big time trends and remain the champions of my brain every time I swing by a Tekken revisit. From champion grannies like Michelle and June, to long-standing fatales like Nina and Anna, I love the leading ladies of this genre.